Greetings, my name is Steve Otlowski, known within the Society for Creative Anachronism as Master Aidan L. Feodor, and welcome to my brief presentation on the history of colors and pigments in the Middle Ages. In the Middle Ages and Renaissance, if you wanted to create a manuscript page, such as this one, or to paint on panel, or on a wall even, uh, it wasn't as simple a matter of going down to the corner art store and buying a few tubes of paint as we would today. You would have to sometimes prepare a lot of the colors yourself and certainly prepare the paints made from them. This is a representation of the palette that would have been available to the artist in the Middle Ages and Renaissance. Uh, the colors varied by time and place, but this is kind of the spectrum that they would have available to them. I frequently consider dividing the colors into their sources. They were made from sources that were animal, vegetable, mineral, and alchemical. I'm going to start out this presentation by looking at some of the animal pigments. The first and probably most common things were made from bones. Uh, if you take bones from an animal, frequently a bird, and put them into a fire, uh, you will initially carbonize them and you'll get bone black. And if you put it in the very hottest part of the fire, and burn off all of the organic components, you'll get bone white. These were very readily available colors uh, that could be made by most any artist. A little further afield, uh, there were the insects Kermes and Grain, two related species, or perhaps two names for the same creature. Uh, they are a sessile scale insect that uh, attaches itself to live oak trees in the Mediterranean area. Uh, they do not, in fact, look much like creatures at all, um, but more like little berries. Uh, they swell up uh, and fill themselves with uh, fluid from the tree, and uh, that fluid includes the red dye uh, that gives the pigment their color. Uh, it can be made into a pigment thus. It was frequently used as a dye for dyeing cloth as well. Uh, somewhat later, the Spanish uh, discovered cochineal, uh, which is another sessile uh, scale insect. Uh, this has far more of the carminic acid in it than uh, the Kermes did, and so it soon replaced Kermes as the color of choice in reds. Uh, it was in fact a state secret in Spain where they came from, because once again, they don't look much like bugs. Perhaps the queen of all animal colors would be Tyrian purple. It is made from a sea snail, a whelk, um, and it takes about 10,000 of them to make a few grams of the pigment, uh, of the dye. This was the dye that was used for the imperial purple, uh, the robes of the Roman emperors. Uh, it can be made into a pigment that's called purpurisium, and there are Roman uh, recipes that have survived to describe how you do that. Uh, this runs at current prices about $100 for 25 milligrams of the dye. There are many different colors that could be made from vegetable sources. Many of these were dye stuffs that were used for dyeing cloth. Uh, this is Brazil wood. Uh, from which the country took its name, uh, and a dye of Brazil wood soaked into a little piece of linen cloth uh, that could be used as a source for the dye as well. Matter root uh, is a, makes a lovely red. Uh, this is a color that is still used even today. And we have some samples of those here. This would be matter. Uh, you can get a wide variety of uh, colors out of the Brazil wood, uh, anything from reddish through purplish, depending on the pH of the pigment. A variety of yellows were used. Uh, this is Weld. It was one of the primary yellow dye plants of the Middle Ages, and it was used to make a yellow in a couple of forms.
saffron uh, and turmeric were two spices that were used uh, to make yellows. Greens. So there were a variety of greens. Uh, sap green, um, they use imitations of this color still today, uh, was made from buckthorn berries. Uh, it could yield either a green or a yellow, depending on whether the berries were ripe. Uh, a green could be made from iris flowers, and the color of this varied from um, a warm green through a very blue green. Uh, you would squeeze the juice from the iris flowers and process it with alum. Folium was a color that was thought to be lost for a while. Uh, it is the berries of Crozophora tinctora, or the turnisole plant. Uh, you can squeeze the juice out of the seeds, and it would produce blues or purples, uh, largely transparent. Uh, a number of other blues were made. Uh, this is a clothlet soaked from woad. Uh, woad was the blue that was used in the Book of Kells, uh, and it was set on plaster to do so. Uh, this is corn flowers. This and many other flowers could be used as colors. One problem with many of the vegetable pigments is that they tend to be somewhat fugitive, so they were easier to use in books where they would be closed away from the light and not fade. Um, a few of them, specifically matter and uh, woad, are far more durable and they were used in other mediums as well. Another of what you might call one of the vegetable colors uh, was orchil. Uh, it was a lichen uh, that grew on rocks. Uh, you could scape, scrape it up and extract a dye from it uh, to produce uh, pinkish and purplish colors. Uh, it was used for dyeing cloth. Um, it fell out of favor um, because of its uh, tendency to fade and the fact that you needed an awful lot of lichen to produce much of the dye. However, this is the purple that was used in the Book of Kells. The mineral pigments can be divided into two main categories, uh, the first of which is the earth pigments. Uh, these are colors made from uh, clays and soft rocks that were used uh, as far back as human history goes. These were some of the ones used in the cave paintings in France and Spain and, and the other things like that. It includes uh, the umbers, the siennas, the ochres, and it also includes some greens. Uh, these are terra verts uh, or green earths, uh, chromium bearing earths from uh, various parts of the world, including uh, France and Cyprus and a number of other places. Uh, these are very, very durable, very easy to use pigments. They have a very fine particle size uh, and can render a remarkable um, number of colors in and of themselves, especially in naturalistic paintings. The other mineral pigments would be those ground up from actual rocks or gems. Uh, we'll start with orpiment, uh, which is a beautiful bright golden yellow, and therefore its name, or or orpiment, or the color of gold. Uh, it has a cousin, Rialgar. Uh, this was used, these two colors were used mostly early in period, uh, when other yellows were hard to get. Um, they are very temperamental and react with other colors quite a lot. Uh, there's also the fact that orpiment is arsenic trisulfate, so it is a rather toxic chemical. Um, we have a number of very popular and beautiful pigments that were made from rocks and gemstones. Uh, this is a sample of malachite, uh, which rendered some beautiful greens that varied from uh, dark green through minty green. Uh, one of the things you had to be careful of with this and with azurite uh, was not to grind it too finely because um, the crystals of the rock are slightly transparent and the more that you grind them, the less light refracts through them and the lighter the color comes. Uh, this is uh, azurite, uh, another of the blue minerals. It's closely related to malachite. Both of them are copper ores in addition to being gemstones. Uh, they can yield some very, very beautiful blues uh, that were used in larger fields, um, blues for painting ceilings, 
etc., etc. Uh, the queen of all of the mineral colors uh, would have been ultramarine, uh, which was made from the stone lapis lazuli. Um, it got its name, Ultramarine, from the fact that it traveled from over the sea, Ultramarine, since the only source of lapis that was available to them at the time was in Afghanistan, so all of it had to be shipped either across or around the Mediterranean Sea. It was worth more than its weight in gold because of the distance the stone had to travel and the difficulty of processing it. Another of the mineral pigments uh, was cinnabar. Uh, this is uh, another beautiful color, uh, red, uh, made from mercuric sulfide. Uh, cinnabar is a rock that would likewise be ground. Uh, it, it was the source, uh, the ore, for making mercury. My last category of pigments segues in from the previous one. Uh, we had been talking about cinnabar uh, being the source of mercury. Well, the alchemists discovered that if you took mercury and sulfur and recombined them in a closed vessel and heated it, uh, you could produce synthetic cinnabar, uh, or vermilion. And it had the side effect of not having the impurities that cinnabar does, so it was a brighter color. This is a beautiful, luscious color. It is very easy to use. It goes on very smooth and very opaque. Uh, some of the very common uh, alchemical pigments uh, are related. Um, if you take sheets of lead or of copper and put them in a wooden box and suspend them over vinegar, and they would frequently bury that in dung, uh, the fermentation of which would keep it warm, um, you would get uh, lead acetate and copper acetate forming on the plates. And you could then scrape those off and uh, use them as a pigment. Uh, lead white is used even today, despite its um, poisonous nature, uh, because it is such a wonderfully opaque uh, pigment and is frequently used to help other pigments dry in oil paintings. If you modify the recipe for verdigris just a bit, uh, you can add salt to the plates uh, by rubbing them with some honey and sprinkling them with salt, uh, or rubbing them with soap and you would get either salt green or rouen green, uh, somewhat richer greens, uh, greener greens than the very blue-green verdigris. If you take lead white and heat it in an open pan uh, so that it can react with oxygen, uh, you get first massico, a kind of peachy color that is somewhat unstable, and then minium. Uh, minium is bright red-orange pigment, um, very, very popular at various times. Uh, it is yeah, very easy to use. Uh, this is, in fact, uh, the source of the idea of a miniature. Uh, not so much that they were paintings painted in manuscripts as it was manuscripts decorated with minium. Uh, later on, we got a number of other alchemical uh, pigments uh, from the glass industry. Uh, these are compounds made of lead and tin. Uh, Naples yellow and lead tin yellow, uh, which as you can see is a beautiful bright yellow. Of course, none of the pigments that we've discussed could be used as is. If you were just, say, to mix them with water and paint them on a surface, uh, it would brush right off. So they would have to be mixed with some sort of binder. A common one uh, for manuscript illumination was gum arabic the resin of a Mediterranean tree, which is still used today for postage stamps and envelopes. You could boil down the hides of animals, animal skins, to make hide glue. Uh, you could use the whites of eggs uh, beaten into glare, or the egg yolk itself if you were painting on panel. So what they would need to do is to take some of the pigment add some of the desired binder, and some water, and they would use a muller, 
such as this. Um, they have much larger ones if you're doing larger scale works. And you would grind it to force the pigment into suspension with the binder. Uh, this is red ochre, so it goes into suspension very easily. Other pigments take a lot more work, such as the lead pigments, which are somewhat hydrophobic. And then you now have a paint that you can use. Of course, later, another addition was made by adding oil into this, the recipe uh, when oil painting became fashionable. I hope you enjoyed this brief presentation. Should you wish to attempt making your own pigments at home, I have some resources available at the end of this video. Good luck!